this. Am I at the right seat or? Yeah, I think we are. Hello, hello, good afternoon. Good to meet you, soll ich sagen. Mein Deutsch ist nicht so gut, dass ich das alles in Deutsch machen kann, aber uh, willkommen. So I, I think German, this is the I nicest like part of all of that, because you get to see how we at the Congress Center back there uh, do the conversations, and we, uh, we will do one as if we're in the Congress Center, but this time you are all in, and uh, later on we will give you the opportunity to actually uh, ask questions to our panelists as well. And, I think we've got uh, quite an amazing panel here on stage for you. As you've seen in the announcement, uh, we will talk about water scarcity and uh, stress. A lot of the topics in uh, Davos this year talk around sustainability, uh, talk about the fact that we are living in a world where the resources uh, will soon reach their limits, and water is one of those key resources. So um, I'm very pleased to introduce the panel to you. Let me start at the, the far left, uh, Sir Mohamed Javar. He's the chairman and managing director of the Kuwaiti Danish Dairy Company. He represents uh, business and uh, business from a part of the world that is uh, the Middle East. Mr. Jim Leap to his left for you. Um, he is the uh, director general of uh, WWF, that's the World Wide Fund for Nature. So representing the NGOs, further to your left, to my right from your perspective, is uh, Minister Etna Molewa. She is uh, the Minister of Water and Environmental Affairs of South Africa. So she is the minister responsible for the whole uh, water uh, part of her country. Uh, then to my left for you. Um, we actually have Mr. John Hickenlooper. Do I pronounce that right? Very good. Good. He's the governor of uh, Colorado, so uh, one of the major states in the USA. To his left, uh, Mr. Martin Dahinden, director general of the Swiss Agency for Development and Cooperation. And even further to the left, far out, is uh, Mr. Peter Brabeck, chairman of the board of uh, Nestle. Um, let me give a very brief introduction. Uh, less than 3% of all the water on Earth is fresh. That's, that's an interesting statistic. 3% of all the water on this planet is fresh, i.e. drinkable water. 2.5% of that is frozen. So we humans actually live of half a percent of all the water on the planet. 70% of the water is used in agriculture, uh, 22 in industry, 8% by households. We live in a world where, unfortunately, still billions of people lack access to, uh, to clean sanitation or use unsafe water for their drinking purposes. And that's why in 2010, the United Nations has uh, declared access to clean water and sanitation one of the basic human rights, and uh, that's been laid down. Uh, of course, we live in a world where we have 7 billion people today. We know that that number will continue to grow. The expectation is it could reach uh, nine plus billion people in 2050. All those people need to be taken out of poverty. So therefore the, uh, the demands on energy, on food, and as a result of all that on water will only increase. Already in 2030, we might uh, face the situation of having a 30% shortfall uh, in water. Um, and in 2050, that stress and the stress caused once more by the combination of having to create more food, use more energy, more people on, uh, on drinking water is going to be one of the biggest challenges and one of the most urgent elements of uh, making the world sustainable. Again, I think we couldn't ask for a better uh, panel to discuss this with you because I'm very, very clear. If we want to solve this incredibly difficult puzzle, we can only do that by having government work with business, with industry, and with NGOs, and at the end of the day, with all of us, the consumers of water, to create the solutions for this. So with that brief introduction, let me hand over to the panel. The format of this afternoon, maybe, 
to make all of you uh, wake up to ask your questions later on. As uh, I have asked each of the panelists to give uh, a brief introduction, how they relate to the topic, what their views are on the questions uh, that are in front of us. Uh, they will each say a few things for maximum five minutes. They've asked me to be a firm on sticking to time, so I'll do that. Then we'll have a bit of a debate amongst um, the panelists here, and then at around, uh, in, in let's say, just under an hour from now, we will hand over the floor to you and give you the, uh, the possibility to, to ask questions. Uh, I'll be very firm with you as well. I know there are many very articulate speakers in the room who would love to make long statements about whatever your belief is on this particular point. To be honest, I'm not interested in statements. I want you to engage with this panel. So a brief question straight to one of the panelists which will then give uh, him or her the opportunity to give you an answer. So please, no long statements. If that is what you are going to do, I will tell you that that is not what I asked for, and I take the microphone away from you. So, apologies for being rude, but these are the rules inside the Congress Center as well. We play exactly the same game with, game with you, and uh, I just warn you, because you do not maybe always come to the Congress Center. Um, all right, Madam Minister, uh, as the lady in the, in the panelist, may I ask you to kick this off and uh, give your views? Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Peter Baker, as moderator. Thank you uh, to the World Economic Forum for this wonderful opportunity. Indeed, it is uh, quite a, a good event, this and that. It's an open forum. We can interact with people beyond the, the Congress Center itself. The topic of today is extremely important and important for all of us that is, as it has already been uh, indicated and illustrated how important water is. We always say water is life and water is at the heart of everything that we do. And therefore it is important that with the limited amount of water that we have as a world, we need to conserve that water. Quite important also given the fact that we also now have the impacts of climate change which are here with us. And indeed, we are beginning to see in many other countries uh, throughout the world that uh, water is becoming scarce or is becoming in overabundance. Just as an example, or just to illustrate, in our country, South Africa, we are one of the countries that are actually water scarce. There are parts of the country that are very uh, short of water. There are and in some parts of the country, we have excess of water at certain times of the year and other times of the year, no water at all. What is it that we need to do and that which we did? With the World Economic Forum, we were here last year, and just to demonstrate the partnership and what we did and what the world can do together, we started discussions here through the Water Resource Group to partner with the Water Resource Group and ensure that there are programs that flow from that. In South Africa, we call that program closing the gap because we have policies, we have regulations and all. But we do know that the old way of doing things of now trying to get water between the catchments and exchanges between catchments does not work anymore. So closing the gap, where are the gaps that needed to, to be done? We looked at two programs, with the first one being ensuring that we do deal with the water mix. In other words, look at other programs of getting underground water usage, uh, desalination, and so on and so on. The second uh, uh, part of the program, uh, which is actually a very, very important uh, one for us, is to ensure that there is a, a, a infrastructure that's uh, uh, worked on, and that's uh, really stopping the leakage, the leakages that are there always. Because this, of the nature of these partnerships uh, that are available and applicable at a global level. We worked through the same uh, water resource group to ensure that at a ground level, there is now what we call the South African Water Partnership Networks, which has started very impressive programs that are actually now doable, and we believe that we are on the right path. Working together, we can do more, and actually working with the civil society, working with business, and the government of South Africa. We are currently a leader and the presiding uh, president of the AMCA, which is the African Minister's Council on Water, and the experiences that we're sharing, we can be able to share with the entire continent. We believe that all of us need to do something if we want the nexus between water, energy, 
and food security to be attained, and all of us must be safe into the future. That's the way to go. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Madam uh, Minister. And many, many of us were recently in uh, South Africa for the climate convention in, uh, in Durban, and we have all witnessed uh, the great work of the South African government out there. Uh, Jim, may I ask you to uh, give the NGO view of uh, water scarcity, water stress, and what we should do? Sure, let me say a few words um, by way of introduction. Um, as Minister Malewa has just said, I mean, water is the blue thread that runs through all of the crises that we face, all the challenges we face as a global community, whether it is food security, energy security, uh, poverty alleviation, biodiversity loss, you see water as a common concern uh, across the board. And so this is a time when we really need to find a way to make sure we're taking a new approach to water management. And let me just say, by way of introduction, a few words about what that needs to do. Um, if you look back over the last century, uh, you could describe our management of water resources as a combination of hubris and engineering. Um, we dominated the water resource. Um, rivers were the sewers of first resort. That's where you put your waste. And management of water systems was about control and extraction. It was about dams and dikes. That, of course, uh, led to lots of problems. And it is that approach is, is at this point, a luxury that we simply can no longer afford because we cannot afford a system in, each, in which each sector just takes what it wants. We cannot afford a system which wastes huge amounts of water because water is, in fact, getting scarce. And we can't afford to, to ignore the needs of the lakes and rivers and aquifers that are the living systems that provide uh, the water we use. So let me just emphasize a few facts, all of which I think are obvious, but all of which are actually important to shaping the way we think about the water management's uh, challenge. The first is that water does not come from a tap. It comes from nature. And so we have to think about water management in terms of the challenge of managing and sustaining living systems. The second is that those living systems provide many values. Some of those values come from extracting the water and putting it to other uses. And some of those values come from leaving the water where it is. Some of those values have ferocious advocates who claim their rights to the, the water to which they believe they're entitled. And some of those uses have no advocates at all. And that, of course, those facts very much compound uh, the challenge of, of managing water. Now, as Peter's already indicated, and the minister as well, the freshwater resources around the world are already in crisis. Uh, the estimate is that 50% of all the world's freshwater ecosystems have already been uh, destroyed. You see scarcity spreading across every region. Uh, billions of people will face water scarcity within the next decade or so. Um, and that situation is getting rapidly worse. The pressure we put on water resources is rapidly escalating. Just to take one example, we have to produce as much food in the next 40 years as we have produced in the last 8,000 years. That's no small challenge. Um, and if we were to ir irrigate those crops at the rate at which we currently use water in irrigation, we'd have to extract twice as much water as we do today. And agriculture is about 70% of all water use. So that's the kind of escalating pressure that you see if you look across the board. And then to add one more bleak fact um, before we talk about solutions, um, we are also entering a period of huge upheaval, um, not least uh, from climate change. The extraordinary weather extremes we've seen over the last year, I've heard one minister after another in this week talk about how their country has faced extreme drought and extreme floods all in the same year. It was true in East Africa, it was true in Mexico, it's been true in other places. And we are locked, already locked, into significant changes in the world's climate. As temperatures rise, weather extremes will also increase. And many of the places where those impacts will hit hardest are places that are already stressed um, by water scarcity. So, to conclude, that just, those facts have two important implications for how we think about meeting the water scarcity challenge. The first is that we have to manage rivers and lakes and wetlands as the living systems that they are and recognize that the water in those systems is valuable not only for the biodiversity that resides there, but for many other uses, not least fish, for example, which is a huge source of protein. So we have to manage them as living systems. And the second is we have to recognize that water is a social good. 
And so we have to find ways to bring all the people who have an interest in a river basin together to, to decide together how water resources are allocated, because that's a social decision. Thank you, Jim. Mohamed Javar, can I turn over to you? Uh, Mohamed, you represent a large business uh, from Kuwait. I mean, what does water mean for your business, and how can you see business be part of the solution? Thank you, and uh, I'd like to thank everyone in the audience for being here on a Saturday morning. It's well appreciated. Um, I come from a part of the world which is quite poor in water. Um, to give you an idea, the average annual uh, water availability per person is 7,000 cubic meters. Uh, in my part of the world, it's under 1,000 cubic meters. What this means is that we have a lot of oil, but we don't have a lot of water, and you cannot drink oil. So um, what happens is that people have been going to the sea to desalinate the water and use it for drinking, use it for sanitation. And some years ago, um, Saudi Arabia decided that in order to have food security, in order to feed its people, it needed to use water for agriculture. So that country became a wheat producer. So they're producing wheat in the desert. After a while, they realized that they have to dig two kilometers into the, the earth to get water out, cool it because it was very hot, use it for irrigation, then 90% of that water evaporated because of the sun. And so in order to solve a food problem, they created a water problem. And that was not sustainable and cannot be sustainable. I use this example to, to, to demonstrate the golden thread that ties water to energy to climate change. What they have done today in Saudi Arabia is that they have realized that that is not sustainable, and they started importing the fodder for um, the cows in their dairy industry from the Sudan or from countries that are water rich. So they're importing the embedded uh, water. So that's a creative solution for them. But the question that this asks is, uh, should they be producing food at all? I mean, there are some crops like rice, like beef, that are water intensive. Are consumers, are you in the audience prepared to change your eating or um, you know, cotton uh, habits in order to reduce water consumption? Because this is not a job for industry alone to do or for governments alone to do. This is somewhere where everyone in society has to be uh, engaged. And um, in every country, the circumstance is a little bit uh, different. And so I was very pleased a few years ago, three years ago, to see that at the World Economic Forum, uh, this issue had been um, recognized and that there was uh, leadership uh, within the forum to do something about it, and that is to bring people from business, people from industry, technology, people from non-government organizations, and put them together and say, what can we do in 2030 or in 2050? Um, if Africa, one billion people, uh, China and India, one billion again, want to consume at the same rate as Europe is consuming, um, the forum estimated we will need three planet Earth. And if they wanted to consume at the rate that America consumes, we would need five planet Earth. So uh, I'm grateful for Mr. Brabeck from Nestle because he has shown leadership within the forum and in the course of two years um, a group was formed that has been able to go to countries like uh, South Africa, like uh, Jordan, like um, I believe the, there are others. And I have seen this program in action where um, the forum comes and diagnoses the problem that exists. So is the water that is being wasted, is that in agriculture? Is this through a leakage of water pipes? So once that problem has been identified, then working with the government, working with the consumers in that country to try to find solutions that will ensure that this water gap is shortened. We don't have a water problem. 
we have a water management problem. And there are people in this room who are trying to fix that problem because there is plenty of hope. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Javar. I should probably say Governor Hickenlooper then. You can Governor. Say John. Hi, John. Um, John is governor for the state of Colorado, and Colorado has the Colorado River, which feeds many states and cities downstream. So whatever water management you're doing in Colorado, it's not just a Colorado problem you're fixing. So what is your view of this topic? Well, Colorado is the, perhaps the only state in the United States where the rivers all flow out. There's no water flowing in, so we like to think that we are uh, stewards for the rest of the for the rest of the country, at least the western United States. And certainly the, the history of water in Colorado, they, they always joke about how uh, water, is for, water is for fighting, whiskey is for drinking. And <laughs> the history is, is, is very divisional, uh, and yet certainly the interrelationship between water and food and energy uh, is the most profound relationship of, of of all civilization, uh, and we see even in, in the center of the United States that international treaties for uh, multinational use of common water uh, is going to be at the core of global prosperity and international cooperation. Um, oftentimes we think that the non-agricultural members of society need to be reminded that in, in most areas, not all areas, but in most areas, irrigated land is at the, the source of their food. They need to be reminded where their food comes from. Uh, in Colorado, we have Denver and a number of cities along what we call the Front Range. And to the west, over the mountains, uh, are the, 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 what we call the West Slope, a number of valleys, beautiful areas, Aspen Vale, Steamboat Springs. Uh, historically, the West Slope and Denver have hated each other over water. Uh, and this goes back over 100 years to when they first you know, the, 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 the clouds come from the Pacific and they dump their water mostly in the, in the form of snow, the most perfect reservoir anyone could imagine, certainly threatened by climate change at the present. And that, that water, uh, almost 100 years ago, the people in the Front Range recognized they would grow and so they diverted large amounts of it through tun tunnels or other diversion products, uh, projects and brought it back to the Front Range. As the Front Range continued to grow, uh, the Front Range now has over 80% of the total population, and yet it's semi-arid. It has uh, less than 14 inches of, of rain per year. So when I, eight years ago, became mayor of Denver, we realized that, that Denver had to take the first step, being the largest city, to demonstrate that that obligation to the rest of the state was critical, and that we had to begin conservation in earnest and find ways of promoting it that were pleasant and made it easy for our citizens to use less water and, and to have smaller yards, to uh, s uh, more efficient toilets, all those things. Uh, we would have uh, billboards and TV ads that would talk about, you know, sh save water, shower with a friend. Uh, <laughs> and this was, these were widespread marketing campaigns, but we also went to our businesses to use the latest in technology to make sure that we used uh, as little domestic water or, or local water uh, in the cooling of our buildings and heating of our buildings. And, and we, year after year, we were able to, our goal was in 15 years, we were able to do it in six years, cut the per capita consumption of water by the residents of Denver by 20%. Uh, and that's the largest in the history of the West in a, in a non-drought situation. And what it allowed us to do, we'd have to go out, of course, as you can imagine, you've got to replace all the pipes and plumbing and infrastructure of a modern water system and if you're selling less water to your citizens, the price goes up per gallon. Those who aren't conserving end up having to pay more for those who are. Uh, and yet we would say to everyone that part of what made Denver what it is was it was part of Colorado. And not just the beauty of Colorado, but having a safe, reliable source of food to the east on the plains where the irrigation would take place. And that proved very successful. It, it was the first time, I think, in, in, in many years. Well. For, for what it's worth, I was the mayor of Denver. In 150 years, no mayor of Denver had ever been elected governor, largely because of the battles over water. But the key is not just finding efficiencies in conservation in, in the urban areas, but equally in agricultural areas. Some of our farmers have been working, we now in dry land farming with no irrigation, have ways of planting our seeds uh, for wheat crops so that you don't have to plow. 
And that allows them, by not turning over the soil and letting the evaporation take away that part of moisture, you're able to uh, diminish the need for water for that crop by almost 12%, sometimes up to 14%. Those kinds of, uh, of innovations are going to, since there is such a large amount of water used in, in irrigation, that's where some of the greatest savings are. But the key is to recognize that the urban areas, agricultural uses have to work together. They both have to recognize that they are joined at the hip in the same way that all of our countries have to recognize that our cooperation is what is truly going to ensure long-term prosperity. Thank you. It's incredibly... It's an incredibly disciplined panel. This is sharp at five minutes every time. Um, I've been somewhat impolite by asking the two Swiss representatives uh, to talk last. Um, that is because we have asked them to talk to you in what for many of you will be your home language. So they will speak, I, it sounds like German, I think it's called Swiss. But, <laughs> but originally I think it, it has, has relations to the German language. Um, for those of you who are unable to master that language, there is, trans, there is translation available. I think English is channel one. So there should be a button on, on your machine and put it on channel one. What I would like to do is uh, ask uh, Mr. Dahin and Martin uh, to, to kick off. You represent uh, the Agency for Development uh, here in, uh, and, and Corporation here in Switzerland. So I'm sure you have studied the relationship between uh, poverty, poor sanitation, and water in great detail. And would you be willing to share your views on water scarcity and stress with the audience? And we'll switch to a uh, German. Now. Besten Dank und ich werde das natürlich in Hochdeutsch machen, obwohl ich sonst immer für den Erhalt der Artenvielfalt bin und von daher eigentlich in meinem Schweizerdeutsch sprechen sollte. Sie wissen alle, dass meine Aufgabe darin besteht, Armut zu bekämpfen, Not zu lindern in humanitären Einschätzungen und einen Beitrag zu leisten zur Bewältigung globaler Risiken. Und in all diesen Aufgaben spielt Wasser eine zentrale, eine oft entscheidende Rolle. Aber ich ich glaube, wir sind in der öffentlichen Diskussion und auch in der politischen Auseinandersetzung noch nicht dort, wo wir sein sollten. Und deshalb bin ich natürlich froh, dass das Thema aufgenommen wird hier am Open Forum, aber schon seit einiger Zeit, seit einiger Zeit am Ich habe vor zwei, drei Jahren mit Erfolg letztlich versucht, das Thema stärker in der schweizerischen Entwicklungszusammenarbeit zu verankern, ist dann letztlich so weit gekommen, dass Wasser zu einem der Themen wurde, dass wir zusätzliche Mittel erhalten haben. Ich bin froh darüber. Zwei, drei Zahlen möchte ich noch nennen. Es sind sehr viele und gute Zahlen genannt worden. Drei Milliard eine Milliarde Leute lebt ohne Zugang zu frischem Trinkwasser. Das ist eine schlechte Neuigkeit, aber die gute Neuigkeit ist die, dass im Rahmen der internationalen Anstrengungen, um den Zugang zu verbessern, eigentlich größere Fortschritte erzielt wurden in den letzten zehn Jahren, als das vorhersehbar war. 1990 im Basisjahr hatte fast ein Viertel der Menschheit keinen Zugang zum sauberen Trinkwasser. 2015 im in 2015, which is our benchmark here, knapp 10% sein. Das uh, ist zu viel. Jeder Mensch, der keinen Zugang hat zum sauberen Trinkwasser, ist ein Mensch zu viel. Aber es sind Fortschritte gemacht worden. Etwa 60 Prozent der Menschen haben Zugang zu sauberem Trinkwasser. Aber es sind Fortschritte gemacht worden. Etwa 60 Prozent der Menschen haben Zugang zu sauberem Trinkwasser. Aber es sind Fortschritte gemacht worden. Etwa 60 Prozent der Menschen haben Zugang zu sauberem Trinkwasser. Aber es sind Fortschritte gemacht worden. Etwa 60 Prozent der Menschen haben Zugang zu sauberem Trinkwasser. Aber es sind Fortschritte gemacht worden. Etwa 60 Prozent der Menschen haben Zugang zu sauberem Trinkwasser. Aber es sind Fortschritte gemacht worden. Etwa 60 Prozent der Menschen haben Zugang zu sauberem Trinkwasser. Aber es sind Fortschritte gemacht worden. Etwa 60 Prozent der Menschen haben Zugang zu sauberem Trinkwasser. Aber es sind Fortschritte gemacht worden. Etwa 60 Prozent der Menschen haben Zugang zu sauberem Trinkwasser. Aber es sind Fortschritte gemacht worden. Etwa 60 Prozent der Menschen haben Zugang zu sauberem Trinkwasser. Aber es sind Fortschritte gemacht worden. Etwa 60 Prozent der Menschen haben Zugang zu sauberem Trinkwasser. Aber es sind Fortschritte gemacht worden. Etwa 60 Prozent der Menschen haben Zugang zu sauberem Trinkwasser. Aber es sind Fortschritte gemacht worden. Etwa 60 Prozent der Menschen haben Zugang zu sauberem Trinkwasser. Aber es sind Fortschritte gemacht worden. Etwa 60 Prozent der Menschen haben Zugang zu sauberem Trinkwasser. Aber es sind Fortschritte gemacht worden. Etwa 60 Prozent der Menschen haben Zugang zu sauberem Trinkwasser. Aber es sind Fortschritte gemacht worden. Etwa 60 Prozent der Menschen haben Zugang zu sauberem Trinkwasser. Aber es sind Fortschritte gemacht worden. Etwa 60 Prozent der Menschen haben Zugang zu sauberem Trinkwasser. Aber es sind Fortschritte gemacht worden. Etwa 60 Prozent der Menschen haben Zugang zu sauberem Trinkwasser. Aber es sind Fortschritte gemacht worden. Etwa 60 Prozent der Menschen haben Zugang zu sauberem Trinkwasser. Aber es sind Fortschritte gemacht worden. Etwa 60 Prozent der Menschen haben Zugang zu sauberem Trinkwasser. Aber es sind Fortschritte gemacht worden. Etwa 60 Prozent der Menschen haben Zugang zu sauberem Trink
Ich bin der Auffassung, dass der öffentliche Sektor eine zentrale Rolle spielen muss in all diesen Wasserfragen. Und das heißt auf der lokalen Ebene, auf regionaler Ebene, nationaler Ebene, aber dann auch über die Staaten hinaus. Das heißt aber nicht, dass das ausschließlich sein soll. Im Gegenteil, der Privatsektor, also die Privatwirtschaft und die Zivilgesellschaft muss eine sehr wichtige Rolle spielen, auch die Wissenschaft. Und uh, unsere Rolle too, in unseren Wasserprojekten and, uh, im Ausland, in Entwicklungsländern und in Ländern in Osteuropa sehen wir dann Europe, sehr oft darin, nicht selber Projekte und Installationen und Infrastruktur zu bauen, sondern eben dahin zu wirken, dass alle diese Stakeholder hineingebracht werden in einen Prozess, der uns am Schluss hilft, äh, die Wasserprobleme zu lösen. Das ist eine große Herausforderung für die Menschheit und ich hoffe mir natürlich, dass in den kommenden Jahren noch sehr viel mehr über dieses Problem diskutiert wird, und dass es sehr viele Lösungen geben wird. Lösungen sind da, teilweise im Anfangsstadium, aber es ist etwas, das wir anpacken müssen und wovon ich überzeugt bin, dass wir dann auch Erfolge haben werden. So last but certainly not least, uh, Peter Brabeck, you've been involved for uh, quite a long time with Nestle, but you've also evolved into one of the uh, important leaders in certainly the corporate world here at Davos. You've taken a leading role at the water issue. So you've studied this probably more than many of us. Uh, what is your view on water scarcity and stress? Ja, zunächst einmal herzlichen Dank für die Einladung, Thank you very much hier zu sein im Open Forum. Das ist immer ein Privileg. Ich spreche wahrscheinlich heute mehr als der Präsident des Wasserressourcengruppe, dem World Economic Forum, in World Economic Forum als Vereinsvertreter des Wasserressourcengruppe. Als was ist diese Wasserressourcengruppe, die What wir gegründet haben vor ungefähr drei, vier Jahren und die dann in das WEF eingebettet worden ist seit zwei Jahren? Jahren. Es ist eigentlich nichts anderes als eine Stakeholdergruppe, eine Gruppe verschiedener interessierten Parteien, die bei sich eingeschlossen hat, Regierungen, NGOs, to uh, bring in governments, NGOs, uh, businesses, uh, development banks, and all these stakeholders have a common task, which is that uh, they take the challenges which we've heard about here this afternoon and try and find solutions to them on the basis of uh, factual um, issues and to try and find the proper balance between supply and demand. And I think when we talk about water, we must be very clear that the supply of water is fixed. That's the First point uh, that I think uh, a lot of people don't understand. We have 4,500 uh, 4, 4, square kilometers of water for available, and that is uh, water we can use. And uh, there's no more than that. And we have to cope with that. Uh, now, when there were three, four, five million people on the planet, uh, and as long as a lot of them didn't need a lot of energy, there was not industry enough. Uh, in those countries either. Then that, that amount of water years. was enough. But about 10 years ago, in ten years, and so not uh, for the past 10 we years, not in 10 years' time, but for the past 10 years, we've been using about 10% more water than we can sustain. So we have a strong problem of using too much water. And that 10% more water that we use, which is unsustainable, comes from two factors. One is not... Uh, uh, not uh, sustainable uh, using water. When Gaddafi uh, built his uh, canal uh, to get to bring to get water to the center of the Sahara, so that uh, he could uh, 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 that he could use it for irrigation, that's not uh, sustainable, and uh, that is a, a not sustainable use, an unsustainable uh, use of water. Uh, we have the 4,500 square kilometers. What, of course? 
is flexible is demand. And demand, of course, depends on population. We've already heard about that. Uh, 10, 7 billion today, and according to the latest forecasts, uh, not 9, but 10, 10.5 billion in, in some years' time. So everybody needs uh, 2,500 calories per day in order to uh, survive and to live. Um eine uh, in, to have zu one, uh, to produce eine one calorie, water. they need one liter Wenn of water. Now, if uh, gibt, you get, uh, zehn liter water, if, if, wenn die vom Fleisch kommt. If you need, if you get also the uh, uh, calories from meat, from meat, you need 10 Aber liters of water. Wir, so at the same time, these the billion of Inder, the Chinese and Asiaten, Indians and Asians, which uh, have been uh, fairly Blöd happy sagen, with a bowl of rice, now they Fleisch say, out, but uh, I don't Kuhn. just want a bowl of rice, I'd and like uh, some chicken or some beef. And that factor has led to a considerable increase in demand for Auf der anderen Seite haben wir dann noch Energie. We have demand for energy. Wir nicht vergessen, dass heute noch zwei Milliarden Menschen keinen Zugang nicht zu zählen Und der Energiesektor war bisher eigentlich relativ, relativ Wasser Aber alle neuen Technologien, die sind unglaublich wasserintensiv. Sie brauchen also im Durchschnitt jetzt zwischen 4 Liter bis zu 6 Liter Wasser, um einen Liter Petrol zu verbrauchen. Das gegenüber diesem fixen Quantum, das wir haben, mit so we have the fixed amount of water, 4,500 square kilometers uh, of water, and we are unglaublichen Wasserstress führen. We, we have uh, two trends which Grund, lead to water stress, and that is why we set up the water resource group. Ich glaube, ich lasse es hier. I think I'll leave it at that for the time being, and uh, perhaps we can come back to it later on. <coughs> Uh, before before going into uh, the discussion with the room, I would like to ask a, a couple of questions to the panelists. Maybe, Madam Minister, I can I can start with you. Like I said in my introduction, in, in 2010, the UN has declared access to fresh water and sanitation a human right. Mm. I, I know the UN and other governments uh, are known for making statements like this. Has it helped? What, what is the impact of elevating something to what I think, as humans, think is the most important statement, those of the human rights? Well, I think in the first place, we need to just state that um, there are, in any given time, 193 countries of the world that are represented at uh, the UN level who set the, and actually identified water, sanitation, part of those that we're talking about here today, education, you name it, health, they went on and on, uh, those goals that uh, were to be attained. Yes, indeed, uh, there were aspirations, but the most critical thing to say here is that we were making statements, rather, the UN was making statements on behalf of all of us as countries that were represented in those discussions. And therefore, what we needed to do when we went back home was to really sit back and say, how do we ensure that those statements that are made become a reality? And that's where the critical point actually come. We as nations means, therefore, that we had to sit back and do this. And this work can't just be done by governments alone. It's work that has got to be done by civil society together with government and business, all being there on the table, the academics and so on. But what we really have seen is that there has been some achievements, yes, in some parts of the country, uh, countries, but yes, in some other countries, these MDG, Millennium Development Goals, especially water and sanitation, they're still lagging far much, far much behind. And therefore, this is what makes it important that at this World Economic Forum and in every national discussion, there's got to be discussion and more than discussion, action action, action, action about what needs to be done. Demand management is very, very critical, as Peter has already indicated. We will not have more water tomorrow. We have to manage the demand as nations. But in that management of demand, we've got to ensure that we also provide water for human consumption. In my country, for instance, we have an allocation that says the RDP standard 
uh, so many liters uh, for, uh, for each individual is actually a right to access uh, for human consumption. But in the same vein, we need to therefore say, we recognize that there's industry, growth, we're now talking about green growth that requires water, energy, for instance, more, more water. But yes, we have to provide that water for industry, not to be wasted. And therefore, there's need, critical need for looking at new technologies, as we are doing right now, new water mixes, as we are doing in South Africa, look at underground water, how we can pull the various uh, water pools in the aquifers without emptying the aquifers and actually depleting the aquifers, as we are right, right now doing. But also much, much more important is the involvement of the public in general. And this is, is very, very, very critical. We think that this is what makes this issue important. Agricultural sector demands more. We need food. As we said, we're talking about the nexus of those three areas. But as we need food, do we have to say there should be an over-allocation in agriculture or an over-allocation in industry, energy, or over-allocation to human consumption? We need to be sober and come up with models that are clear, that actually speak to these three things, without making this water a very emotional issue. In my country, we have it in the Constitution that water is a human right. Human right. But yes, we are very conscious of the fact that everybody else needs to be allocated water, industry as well, without wasting. Thank you. Thanks. Um, thank you. I'd, I'd, I'd like to uh, ask the panelists to uh, keep their answers oh, brief. Uh, I'm, I'm always a bit polite to ministers. Um, <laughs> that's my upbringing, sorry. Thank you. Um, uh, Peter Brabeck, as uh, chairman of the uh, Water Resource Group, you've probably studied this issue more than, uh, than many of us. Uh, it, it's been mentioned a few times, there's this nexus, this, this interlinkage between food for drinking, sanitation, or water for drinking, sanitation, for irrigation and food production for getting energy, for getting fibers. Do we humans have enough understanding of those interlinkages? Do we know enough to make the optimal allocation choices? And, and is business and government and NGO working enough on the topic to, to solve it? What is your view? <coughs> No, I think it's fairly clear that uh, we do not yet have this understanding of the nexus between the various types of demand uh, that uh, the Minister has just mentioned. No, we don't understand them enough, and that's one of the things uh, that uh, we started to tackle first in the Water Resource Group. We wanted to get the facts and put them on the table. There's some very interesting facts which uh, probably are not, understand not understood by the uh, politicians, we have not to put too fine a point on it. We said uh, uh, we need 2,500 calories per day to live. Now, we uh, consume 50,000 calories per person in energy to, for transport, for heating, for cooling, and so on and so forth. Now, in other words, that nexus, 2,500 calories for each person, to 50, live and survive 50,000 calories, 50, calories 20, 20 times more uh, used in energy. And why do I mention this? Simply because we have to realize that uh, politicians say we need 20% of those 50,000 calories in the energy sector and we have to uh, shift them to uh, the food sector. Uh, then if they say that, they haven't understood what this is all about. Because how are you going to take 20% of a 20 times bigger market and shift it to the food sector? Sector. How are you going to do that? That means that we, in, we produce, we, we need um, to produce three times as many, uh, three times as much food to produce biofuels. And that's why when this policy on biofuels came out a few days ago, uh, food prices went up, uh, rocketed up. And there were hundreds, uh, hundreds of people, thousands of people, who, were, who, were, who were, uh, were driven into hunger because the politicians didn't understand the nexus. And uh, the supply side is fixed. That's something they haven't understood. And I think that's probably one of the best examples of that nexus. Uh, John, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm, I'm just pushing the, 
question as an example, which plays in other parts of the world as well. The Colorado River not only has to take care of the people of Colorado, but flows downstream, I think, all the way into California. Right. And it has been a source of life for many people, therefore, in Colorado, all the way up to California. But in recent years, I'm told that the supply of water from the river has become more unstable the further downstream you actually come. So this, I think, if those facts are right, is, is a very clear case of how do we actually allocate water? Is it all for the Colorado people, or how do you think about regulating that also the people from California or whatever other states are downstream have access? Well, it's been a very difficult problem. Uh, there's a, a thing called the Colorado Compact that, that defines who gets how much water uh, in, in periods of shortage. Uh, we did have some serious drought in the first part, early part of the 2000s. And the, the difficulty is, is as different regions grow at different rates, people have been promised a certain amount of water. By the time their population grows or their agricultural needs increase, the water is no longer there. And most importantly, I think, and Jim Leap talked about this a little bit, we also have an obligation to make sure that water remains in the river to go into the ocean, right? At a certain point, we have to look at the quality of the water for beyond just what we need to drink or to uh, grow crops, but for, for the life cycle of the planet. Uh, at a certain point, we have to, re to require what we call in-stream flows uh, that that are going to maintain the, the, the diversity and the health of the, of the entire planet. And I think Sylvia Earle was here earlier and was talking a little bit about the, the vast dead zones we see in oceans, right? As we diminish the, the, the quality of the water going from, you know, all these different uses uh, before it goes in the ocean, uh, you, end up, you end up losing the, that, that vitality. And I think that's Colorado and the states, Nevada, Arizona, Utah, and California that are part of the, of the Colorado Compact. We become a good microcosm, and, that, and we have to be able to figure it out, or else the, 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 the countries of Africa and Asia will never be able to figure it out. Thank you. Um, Mr. Javar, uh, you represent business. I, I have often believed and still believe that business, once they have the right focus, can be a big part of the solution to anything. How can business contribute to solve this demand and, uh, and supply issue? in water. Can you give any examples in preferably your own business or other businesses in which you've seen business play a powerful role? Yes. Um, as I said earlier that I come from a part of the world where water is scarce and um, but where you have people, maybe a hundred million people live there, they need to eat. It is possible to produce food even if you don't have a lot of water. Um, I run a dairy company in my country, but I don't have any cows. So, <laughs> so how is it possible? It's, the cows live in New Zealand. They live in Ireland. They, they live in Australia. They, they have water. They have green pastures there. They produce milk. The water is removed from that milk. It becomes a powder. It is shipped over to Kuwait, and there it is recombined, so water is added to it, and then it is sold. So basically, to produce one liter of milk, or you can say juice or other foods, um, the carbon footprint of bringing that concentrate into the country is as minimal as possible, and then the uh, stress on the water resources is as minimal as possible. So with innovation, and you know, this wasn't invented in the Middle East, it was invented in Denmark and Switzerland. So there are technologies there, these are old technologies. There are newer technologies also that can be used to look at a particular situation and say, is this sustainable or not? What is the best solution here? Um, but first, you need to have the facts. Because if you don't have the facts, you don't know where to focus. Touching on the point you made earlier about the United Nations saying it's a human right, of course it's a human right. The thing is that once you've supplied how much water is a human right, and you have to talk about pricing at one point or another 
in this equation because it is not an unlimited human right. You know, if you have a right to so many liters of water for drinking and for sanitation a day, and that has been made available, beyond that, um, you shouldn't fill your swimming pool with water at the same price. And I think the minister in South Africa, they have a program where there is a scale. So water is provided to people who cannot really afford it at very low prices uh, in certain quantities. And then as you go up, uh, it's a different rate applies to industry or to people. So going back to the question of, uh, of industry, industry alone cannot do much. Government alone cannot do much. We need science to come in and help. We need to understand, is the problem, take for example um, India. In India, 30% of the food is wasted, solid food, and I want to make the distinction that solid food is also water. Um, so they make the wheat or they make the grain using a lot of water for reasons I won't get into right now, but uh, pumps are provided free, so Farmers use a lot of water rather than drip irrigation and other ways of uh, producing food which are less water intensive. Then, for the food security of the country, this grain is stored in huge silos. Because the silos are not protected, rats come and eat the grain. With a little bit of investment in the infrastructure, all the water that was used to make that grain uh, would be saved. Yeah. So there are steps that are, you know, that. Ca but you have to understand that this is a problem because you don't want to go and tell consumers, ah, uh, don't use so much water when brushing your teeth when the problem is either in agriculture or in Delhi, for example, the pipe work leaks. Yeah. If you increase the capacity of the water, you're increasing the leakage, you're increasing the problem. Uh, in Singapore, they recognized that and they fixed the leak. So you must have the science, and this is where the Water Resource Group has been uh, really focusing on the problem first so that if it is industry that is taking or abusing water, then you go after industry. If it's agriculture, you go after agriculture, and if it's consumer, it's consumer. So alone, business can do nothing. Okay. But it is with, you know, cooperation. cooperation. Yes. Good. Thank you for that. Jim, um, listening to the panel, uh, we understand there is a lot of stress between food, fuel, fibers, water, but uh, I, I think the planet needs water as well for its ecosystems. Is that, to your point of view, enough put into the mix, or are we just trying to fix our human uh, issues and thereby causing damage in the, uh, in the, in, on the planet? Uh, there's been increasing recognition, I think, over the last couple of decades that that, that has to be in the mix, that there has to be water reserved uh, for in-stream flows, as they're called uh, in the U.S. And in fact, uh, the Water Act in South Africa has that explicit requirement, uh, that there be a reserve uh, for nature. So that's, a, that's an important start. I think the challenge we have is that water resources in a given river basin nonetheless tend to be over-allocated. And once over-allocated, it's often hard to get the allocations back. Right, to actually reduce the uses by those who have legal rights to them or approved allocations in the interest of main, uh, mainstream, uh, maintaining uh, in-stream flows. So there is a big management challenge there, uh, and it requires that we, uh, number one, recognize the, the, the economic as well as aesthetic and biological values of those in-stream flows. Uh, just to take two examples, I mean, we... Uh, we work in the Mekong Basin, which is one of the most heavily populated river basins in the world. And there are 60 million people in the Mekong Basin who live, whose protein comes from freshwater fish. Right? So the health of that river system is actually critical to their diet. To take a second example, we have over the last decade been in a program in the Yangtze which has helped to restore 3,000 square kilometers of wetlands in the central Yangtze. Those wetlands store more flood water, nearly, no, sorry, more than half of the flood water storage of the Three Gorges Dam, the largest dam in the world. So these, there are real economic values here as well as other values. And the trick, therefore, is to get to river basin management, which can, in fact, come to grips with these problems, to deal with over-allocation 
in the interest of making sure you safeguard in-stream needs and deal with the distribution among other uses in an equitable and, and uh, prompt way. Great. Thank you, Jim. Um, Mr. Dainan, uh, what examples have you seen of governments, companies, NGOs working together, I assume mainly in the poor parts uh, in your experience that have worked? W what can you share with the audience on that? Yeah. Das ist eine sehr wichtige well, Frage. Ich glaube, was wir jetzt immer issue. im Ton think, uh, hatten bisher, uh, das ist so ein Blick auf die Krise, auf die Katastrophe und dann eben zu wenig, the, uh, zu wenig auf die Lösung. Und das finde ich ja das Faszinierende beim Thema Wasser. And das what is fascinating about water is that uh, water is very often a way of trying to find solutions hinaus. to uh, problems and kann other zu problems. Führen, uh, water can lead to conflicts in, 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 in the Middle East or in Central Asia, where there are very different interests in place in Kyrgyzstan, Kyrgyzstan, in 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 and then releasing it uh, in the, the winter. And Uzbekistan, which is down here, that needs it for cotton and uh, other and agricultural production. And if we want to hand hand this problem and find a proper solution, then it can be um, a, a way of finding solutions to other problems. Das ist sehr Ebene natürlich der Studien gewesen. Uh, eine Arbeit begonnen We've im Mittleren Osten, uh, wo ich davon überzeugt bin, dass in einigen Jahrzehnten and, uh, nicht mehr das Problem recently, Israel und die uh, umliegenden arabischen Staaten im Zentrum no stehen, sondern das Wasserproblem, uh, wo wir eben Israel versuchen wollen, Evidenz zu schaffen, years, oder so wie das in der Waterresource Group uh, angedeutet wird, dass Leute zunächst einmal auf einer technischen Ebene sich auseinandersetzen und dass sie dann auf einer anderen Look at the technical issues über das Wasserproblem and reden talk about, uh, und nicht ständig in die Strukturen des um, alten Konflikts zurückfallen. Of, uh, das sind Beispiele. Und ich hätte natürlich jetzt sehr viele Beispiele so aus Lateinamerika, Flussläufen, uh, wo man uh, einen America, Ausgleich sucht zwischen uh, Leuten am uh, Oberlauf oder die eine uh, ökologische Funktion haben und Leute am Unterlauf des Flusses. Das sind alles Dinge, oder die man dann auch auf unserer Zeit ansehen kann. Aber ich möchte auf diese, dieses Potenzial, eben auch Konflikte zu überwinden und zu lösen, hinweisen, wenn wir uns mit dem Wasser befassen. Ihre Moment gekommen. Und jetzt, noch einmal, die Regeln sind klar. Keine Erklärungen. No statements, please. Case mache ich die because if you want to make a long, Schluss, rambling statement, then I shall have sagt? the microphone switched off. Nur eine Frage. Das sind hier I'd sehr like viele you Leute. to raise questions. So nur eine Frage we pro have person. a lot of people, so only one question per person. Leute etwas hier fragen. And then uh, we'll have as many questions as possible. So please give your name stellt, if you uh, want to put a question. Introduce sagen yourself sie, wie von die and uh, das, then uh, state which of the panelists you are addressing your question. <laughs> so there is an hair in the background. There's uh, a gentleman uh, in the back row there. The mic one of those is the last one. It's connected. Is it? it could be. Yes, good afternoon. My name is Stefan Kleinsorger. I have a question to Mr. Brabeck and Sir Jaffa. Because, Mr. Jaffa, you said we need science. And um, I just have a very short question. Yeah. Do you think that to give the world, the football world championship in 2018 to Ku Kuwait was really justified considering the impact such an event has on food energy and water, or should not, Mr. Brabeck, your organization involve all kinds of bodies to consider these questions when talking about major football or sports events? Thank you. Uh, thank you for that. Um, <laughs> I, I think, first of all, 
the, the, it wasn't given to Kuwait, it was given to a neighboring uh, country. I, I, I don't think it should have been, but I don't make these, uh, these decisions. I think they will have a lot of problems because in, 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 in Qatar, um, you know, I, I don't think you're allowed to drink alcohol and many of the fans are going to be very disappointed when they, <laughs> when they get there. And if you ever tried to play football in 40 degrees heat, uh, I think you should go to uh, the Football Association in, in, in Switzerland and have a word with them for the decision that they have uh, uh, made. <laughs> Peter, anything you want to add to that? No? Okay. <laughs> the next question, Peter. Next question, please. Please, the lady with the glasses. Thank you. Um, so far, you've been... Oh, can I have your name, please? Ah, sorry, Jasmine Stadler. I'm Swiss. Um, so far, you've mainly focused upon the allocation of water as soon as you've got it. However, um, Mr. Higginlooper has already started talking about it through his microcosm in Colorado, and Mr. Dahan has hinted at it in, in Asia and in the Middle East. Uh, water conflicts, for example, China pulling dams in Tibet and kind of stopping the Mekong River. How much are these problems being emphasized in groups like the Water, Resi uh, water Resource Group and in, for example, development agencies in Switzerland, as opposed to just allocation and, and efficiency? Mr. Dainan, uh, you want to take that question? Also, I can keep I keep again an yes, answer. Yes, I'd be quite happy to try and uh, answer that. Es ist interessant, oder, dass I think it's interesting uh, die Wasserfrage that it's basically the question of water, water which has always in played an enormous role in international Meines relations. As I understand it, the first international organization was the uh, Rhine uh, the, uh, the uh, Rhine uh, Transport Organization, uh, which uh, started up in 1860 after the Vienna Congress. Und das so I wir think uh, and this is what we're starten, doing, we must try uh, sich mit diesen to, Problemen befassen, uh, get, uh, zu geben. to get states die involved in these issues and provide them with models. Kann und uh, Switzerland Aber is not a country which can impose its solutions on other countries, dadurch, and it doesn't want to do that. But we do have our own Europa, experience because we, 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 as in Colorado, most of the rivers in Switzerland uh, 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 provide water to other countries. So we know that we have to cooperate, and uh, in cooperation with the Mekong Commission, uh, we uh, are trying to provide our good services. We're offering models, but we are certainly not imposing our models. And I think it's very positive that uh, in more and more places in the world, uh, developments of this kind are underway, and that, I think, uh, is uh, very much a part of what we're talking about here today. I look at it uh, politically. Bei der and, uh, Group, I think uh, nicht so im Vordergrund steht, aber this es is uh, why uh, the Water Resources Group, Group is perhaps very erfahren. acting more in the background, but I'd yeah, like you. to hear more from uh, Mr. Brabeck about that. Weil, uh, yes, thank you. Uh, if I could uh, perhaps explain how the Water Resources Group uh, works, we're a fairly small group with a fairly small budget. What we do is basically only work with governments, and we uh, get a request from governments to help them out. What we can contribute is know-how. We've carried out analyses of the 145 water um, basins. We have worked out a model for each water basin, which enables us to propose various measures. Uh, we've calculated how much these measures would cost, so we can come to a government and say, in principle, this is a, ty this is a type of measure that you could take, and this is what it would cost you. And then we also demand that the government uh, uh, takes uh, a financial stake in the project. In other words, we are nothing more, basically, than uh, a technical support organization. Uh, but uh, the response to every question is made by governments, local or national. We don't uh, prescribe water policy. We simply provide technical help to governments who want it, and we help them to produce a policy. And this was the case in South Africa, where with uh, the minister um, and we signed a contract in May, and from 
Wir gründen dann in jedem Land eine Public-Private-Partnership, die mit der lokalen Regierung Und dann sind diejenigen, die in der globalen Wasserressourcengruppe sind, nicht unbedingt die gleichen wie die lokale Regierung. Also in der Mongolia oder in Indien oder in Mexiko oder in Indien, in den fünf Ländern, mit denen wir heute zusammenarbeiten, haben wir jedes Mal in der Welt eine dezentrale There is a decentralized organization in each one of those countries, a decentralized PPP with local NGOs, with local development banks, with development agencies like the Swiss Development Energy, but we also work with the Swedish, with the German and other development agencies. So very small central organization and a very decentralized local organization. That's the way it works. Jetzt, ja, kann ich, die Damen dort? The lady over there, please. Um, my name is Lillian Stadler and I study at the University of St. Andrews. I had a question for Mr. Leap. Um, I was wondering, um, you spoke a lot earlier about the role of agriculture um, in the current water debate. And I was wondering what your thoughts were on um, monoculture and its effect not only on water consumption, but also on water pollution. So I can't uh, actually speak to you directly about monoculture versus other cultures. I, what, um, being a lawyer and not an agriculture expert. Uh, but f for us, I mean, there, there is huge potential uh, in a variety of ways in terms of cropping, in terms of cultivation techniques, in terms of uh, pra other practices to reduce water use uh, in agriculture, and actually quite significantly. Um, especially, of course, in places uh, where water is uh, free, you often see a lot of, uh, you, you often see very inefficient use of water resources, uh, and in fact, across the board. Uh, and so there's in fact huge scope there, for which I'm sure cropping choices are part of the solution, but I can't take you deeper into the specifics. Okay, there's a question all the way in the back of the room. Thank you. My name is uh, Paul Eckley. I work for State Farm Insurance in uh, America. A, cu a question for John Hickenlooper, please. Uh, have you gotten general acceptance for increasing the price of water in agricultural usage in Colorado amongst the citizens? Oh, that's always a difficult question. Um, <laughs> I want to go back to point out that, that I now recognize that Colorado is the Switzerland of the Americas, and that we have that <laughs> shared. We have done that, and, and, and that's a, a the, the difficulty there, and it is a huge issue on the east, the plains to the east of the urban corridor that ro long, runs along the Rocky Mountain front. The as as the urban areas have grown, they go out and purchase water rights, which are bought and sold just like any any consumer product almost, uh, except they have more lawyers. The <laughs> they end up driving that price up. And what happens is there becomes an, a, a reverse incentive for as badly as we want to maintain every, every hectare, every acre of, of agricultural land in production, we see it drying up. Uh, and we've, we've managed to stop this for the last, oh, five years or six years. But the, they set their, I mean, their water rights are set by the market. Uh, so they, most of them, those who own water rights, are, their water rights aren't going up, except in, in certain cases where the cost of distribution has increased somewhat. But the value to them becomes an incentive to pull land out of, uh, out of irrigation. It's, that whole pricing structure, one of the things we did with, it's, it seems bizarre that we haven't done this worldwide, but you know, most of capitalism is based on the more you purchase of something, the cheaper the price per unit. Right, which is in, 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 in resources that are so scarce, like water and, and energy, it, it's, it's crazy, where there, or energy at least, where there are negative consequences to the overconsumption. So what we try to do with that agricultural use is to, is to uh, disincentivize them, to give them some stability of, of markets. We're trying to work with rotational fallowing, so that you get a number of, of uh, uh, farmers together 
that over a period of every five years, one of them will keep their land uh, uh, fallow. They won't use any water, but they all will share the revenue. They'll sell that water to the urban core so that you get to keep all the land in production. It becomes much more efficient. But it, it continues to be a major worry, and we, and we have not found the final solution. Hey, Madam Minister, maybe can I build on that? Because I understood from Mr. Yavar that you have a, an innovative system in South Africa, and if that's right... One of the ways in, in a situation where uh, demand threatens or already is higher than supply is to play with the pricing element of whatever commodity we're dealing with. Is price of water an enough used instrument? Well, yes. In South Africa, we let me just say firstly that we, historically we have we had rights uh, to people, in particular those who are in the agricultural sector, uh, allocated water um, and, and, and called rights. When we wrote the new law, uh, that was back then in 2000, 2004, thereabout, we then changed the rights to be entitlements. In other words, entitlements that could actually be reduced or otherwise unless proven that we actually can be able or you are using those rights or the entitlements. And therefore, uh, through the licensing methods, we now relicensing new entrants as well as new operators, whether they be in the industry, any other industry, agriculture also, new entrants even in agriculture. But yes, the pricing is an issue because the prices of water has been varying between agricultural sector and various other industries, as it has been already been indicated in, in, earlier on. For human consumption, the poorest of the poor are allocated free of charge. And this is, I think it's six uh, kiloliters of water per annum allocated free to the poorest of the poor. But industry, the price varies. And it is some, something that we are actually currently looking at. As I speak, we are working on the pricing, new pricing strategy in South Africa so that the tariffs can be determined in accordance to the way we would like to have it. And obviously, again, dialoguing with industry and with everybody else in the country. Thank you. Next question. There's a lady in the far back of the room. My name is Marianne Nunes Grabe, and I have a question about everybody's talking about water management and water sharing and water pollution, but what about the overpopulation like in the, in the desert? There never was a lot of water and there will never be a lot of water. And with so, much, so many people in the world, is it even possible to have uh, equal water right for everyone? Well, you have a supporter in the front of the room. Um, well, I, th I think the first part of the answer is it's become a UN right, so wherever people live, they have a right to get to water. The question is probably should we allow more people to go to areas which are wetter, water stressed? Um, can I ask, Martin, is there from the policymakers in the world any view on that? Vielleicht muss ich äh, doch noch etwas ergänzen uh, zu dieser should, uh, Diskussion über die Überwasser aus Menschenrechte. About, uh, es ist interessant, dass die ursprüngliche right. Menschenrechtscharta formuliert uh, wurde nach dem Zweiten Weltkrieg. Man gewisse Dinge für selbstverständlich hielt, also beispielsweise Wasser haben uh, soll oder Atemluft beispielsweise. Und das hat man dann gar nicht produziert. Und hat zu einem Menschenrechtsgemacht. Jetzt wasn't, das, was passiert uh, ist, 2010, is ist natürlich in, uh, in erster that, Linie uh, ein klares politisches Statement und ein Verhalten in die Verantwortung nehmen der Staaten. And, uh, es ist aber nicht so, dass das ein einklagbares Recht ist und es ist nicht einmal ein einklagbares Recht, 
and it is not an enforceable right in Bolivia uh, also man muss sich dessen uh, bewusst sein. Ein Recht auf Wasser, auf Trinkwasser, heißt auch nicht, dass es gratis ist. Meinungsäußerungsfreiheit und so weiter bedeutet auch nicht, dass sie beispielsweise das Zeitungsabonnement nicht bezahlen müssen oder einen Anspruch darauf haben, dass ihre Meinungen überhaupt abgedruckt werden. Also man muss das sehen als politisches Statement. Jetzt die Frage des Bevölkerungs Wachstums, das ist eine enorm wichtige Frage und in einem gewissen Sinn ist ein Ungleichgewicht da. Es leben gemessen an unseren Ressourcen äh, zu viele Leute und da gibt es, glaube ich, für mich zwei Dinge. Das eine ist das, was wir heute diskutiert haben, dass wir schauen, wie wir vernünftiger, besser mit den Ressourcen umgehen können. Das andere ist dann eben zu schauen, wie wir das Bevölkerungswachstum bremsen können und dort hat eben alle Evidenz gezeigt, dass die Armutsbekämpfung die Regel also ganz entscheidend ist, dass also die Geburtenzahlen erst dann zurückgehen, wenn die Armut der Leute reduziert ist und es eben nicht umgekehrt ist, dass man mit was für Maßnahmen auch immer das Bevölkerungswachstum bremsen kann, um die Armut zu verringern. Das ist die wissenschaftliche Evidenz und deshalb ist natürlich für die Zukunft des Planeten für die ökologische Zukunft ist ganz zentral, dass wir die Armutsthematik unter Kontrolle bringen, dass es weniger Menschen gibt, die mit weniger als einem oder zwei Dollar pro Tag leben oder überleben müssen. Ich werde zurück zum Ende des Raums kommen. Da ist zu Ihrer Seite der Mann mit dem Tee. Ja, ein neuer Fan von Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, I wanted to ask, uh, from, I'm a tech pioneer here, so I wanted to ask, if you look at technologies, uh, much, much cheaper uh, ways to make water uh, for innovators, given this ambiguity of price in different locations, let alone over time, um, for an innovator who's looking for a breakthrough solution, for instance, to take saline aquifer water and produce fresh water, how could one uh, anticipate the price demand to justify the kind of capital it would take to take such a risk on disruptive technology. I mean, the same issue exists in energy. It's a little worse because there are very large companies that basically are incumbents that could prevent some of this from getting all the way to market. But in water, it's not clear to me how somebody takes a lab technology, of which there are many, that could be quite disruptive and create a justification to solve this real problem. So any, anybody who has any answer, I'd appreciate it. I don't know who would. Anybody has a view on that? I, I would give uh, just a quick suggestion. There are, are places in the world where there, there is a, a great deal of cap, capital in play for those kinds of solutions. The obvious place is Israel, uh, where they are making dramatic steps, and I think there's capital ready to go there. Then it will just propagate from there. Southern California also has a number of pilot projects. Is there anything the, uh, the resource group does on this, Peter? Yeah, I think. Uh, we are looking, of course, into any technologies that is available. And um, uh, what, what, what you still have to consider is, for the time being, the only real uh, supply side would be desalination. And there, for the time being, we are coming into conflict between the energy demand, CO2 output, and what you are getting from the water side. So I give an example. In order to produce one liter of bio diesel, you need 9,100 liter of water. One liter of bio diesel, 9,100 liter of water. In order to produce 1,000 liter of desalinated water, you need two to three liter of bio diesel. <laughs> See, it doesn't, just, it doesn't work out for the time being. Now, this is, this is a one area where without any doubt, technology hopefully will help in the future. Because if we find an, an efficient solution to be able to use the salt water as drinking water, 
big part of the problem is solved. Then we can work on the supply side. But for the time being, because of these two limitations, this is not realistically. So we have to concentrate on the demand side. Okay, um, moving forward, one row, the, the lady in front. Thank you, hello, my name is Stella Thomas with the Global Water Fund. And um, of course, unfortunately, or I should say water of course is a human right, but unfortunately we don't respect it unless we have an adequate price for it. So I'd like to address uh, any and all of the panelists. Going forward, how do governments um, bring together, we need to use water as a tool for economic development and investing in water proving that it, it the multiplier effect affects economic, social, and political development. So how do we bring that into global politics? Do we bring it into the WTO? Or have you seen any examples where we can raise the consciousness and the urgencies with political officials and, um, you know, there's, and, and remind ourselves of, the, of our humanness and the importance of, of water. Uh, are there any good examples or any comments? Thank you. I think Jim. Uh, well, I'll first. speak to at least part of that question. You touched on several things. The, um, let me step back on the question of cost, I mean, of pricing. Uh, and I want to go back to something I said at the beginning, which is this, it's very important to recognize that water is a social good and that allocation and management of water resources needs to be through social democratic processes. Right? It can't just be a market, which means that you have to have a way to make sure you're allocating water to in-stream need needs, to basic human needs, and making social decisions about what the other allocation should be. So that pricing needs to be thought of in that context. If you have a robust water management system, which has made those allocations and, and decided how to ma manage those allocations in times of stress, then pricing can be a tool for helping to drive the right decisions. But you, you really have to make sure that it's in that context. You see uh, a growing number of countries, and partly through the work of the Water Resources Group, but other efforts as well, um, countries such as South Africa, who are getting, who are really moving forward in terms of managing, bringing stakeholders together around managing water resources, especially in river basins, for example. And I think that's getting to some of what you're talking about recognizing that this is a fundamental economic research resource as well as social resource, and making those decisions um, in a way that's intelligent about uh, the, the resource that's being shared. Uh, I don't know of a, a role for the WTO in that, but maybe other panelists have a comment on that part. Martin? Ja, ich wollte genau auf das I wanted to precisely nicht, to answer that point. Das ist möglich, I don't ist, think it's possible in the area of water to introduce general rules as was the case of the exchange of goods or services in WTO. Water is something which uh, is uh, very linked to its context, haben, and I think the solution to the question you've raised is in uh, the water policies of individual governments. And, uh, and uh, coalitions of governments, and also uh, with uh, the inclusion of all the stakeholders. General overall rules valid throughout the world, I simply don't believe it. Uh, let's move forward to this gentleman. He's been trying to get a question asked for a while. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank you for the moderation. The moderator said that we could only put uh, uh, questions in a democratic country. This is simply not possible, uh, uh, that uh, NGOs um, can only ask questions. That's a slight objection to what you said. But I wanted to say something about uh, uh, about um, population explosion. Mr. De Hinton said we should reduce poverty. I thoroughly agree with him. Uh, and uh, it, the, one of the MDGs is to, is to half extreme poverty by 2015. How can we uh, produce, uh, uh, reduce uh, poverty by half without reducing wealth by half, extreme, extreme wealth by half? I'd like to have panelists comment on that. For the panelists, uh, the question is how can you solve poverty if you don't solve the enormous wealth at some parts of the world? So anybody has a, a voluntary view on that? Well, I'll answer in German. 
unterlegend auf der Frage I think, um, ist natürlich behind uh, that question, dieses Gefühl, dass es nur that, uh, ein, ein, there is a feeling, eine Lösung gibt, wenn einer gewinnt und einer verliert. You can only uh, find a solution Frage. if someone, uh, Sie haben gesagt, if someone wins wie kann man and someone else loses. You said, how can you reduce extreme poverty without reducing uh, extreme ja, wealth also by heißt, half? So the question is, is then, Lösung, there is a solution, ist die uh, and you have the same quantity, and uh, you can uh, have one Weil group lose and the other group will win. But I think that's wrong. I think that's basically wrong. But I think what we have to do is to create more wealth, more value than that zero-sum game. That's the issue. And uh, that's why uh, this issue about the zero-sum game is fundamentally wrong. Uh, I thoroughly agree with you that we haven't yet been very successful. But that's my answer. OK. Uh, one more question here in the front, and then uh, we're going to wrap up. Does work? Yes. Yep, now it does. Hi, um, my name is Jack Shearer, and I come from Malibu, California, in the U.S. And my question is, to any of the panelists, is as water becomes more and more scarce in the coming years, would water privatization be one of the remedies to this problem, or should water still be a public good and managed by government? Okay, I'm not sure the microphone worked, so the question is, is water privatization the solution, or should it remain a public good? OK, uh, John, I'm glad you're here, man. So I would argue, probably get both sides up here. I, I, I think it would be a terrible mistake to, to turn it over to, the, to private interest, because it is a, a human right. Uh, some of the things that we're, we're finding now, uh, considering Malibu has both water problems and money income discrepancy problems, so it's, you can speak strongly to each. The, the challenge is you, we'll never get the systemic changes uh, through the compartmentalized privatization. Right now, we joke, that, but we're very close. In the next two or three years, we'll have, by the time water from the, from the mountains leaves the state of Colorado, it will have been used five times. We don't like to advertise that. People don't find that appealing oftentimes. I, actually, I spent, I spent 15 years in the restaurant and the t beer business, and we would put little cards in the urinals uh, in the restrooms of our competitors saying, with a logo of our beer, Rail Yard Ale, and it would say, coming out, all beer is pretty much the same, but going in, there is a difference. But, <laughs> but, but the truth is, the truth is that one of the solutions, in, 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 not in desert areas, but in many places, is finding ways where you can reuse the water uh, with a sufficient efficiency, you, in other words, minimize the evaporative needs in terms of that purification, so that you do expand water. I don't think you can do that, that kind of systemic, it's hard to imagine that happening through uh, private effort. Thank you. I, I, I'd like to wrap up the session. There's two minutes left. As you know, in Davo, every meeting ends precisely on time, <laughs> as you would expect in Switzerland. Rather than me summarizing, let me ask each panelist to give a one-sentence answer. We've here concluded that water is, uh, is under stress, that the demand and supply might not be in balance and that will only get worse. It might even be a more urgent problem than climate change. Are we doing enough and are we capable of fixing this stress? Can I start on the far left, my, your right, and then end with uh, Mr. Brabeck? Mohamed, well, one sentence only, right? It's all time we have. Uh, two, two words then. I think that yes, working together, we can. Thank you. Jim? Uh, so we are not yet doing enough, but if we ma manage these systems as the living systems there are, we can, in fact, uh, meet our water needs. Thank you. We need to work together as global citizens and probably answer and trying to answer the previous question. The three pillars of uh, development, people, planet, prosperity, the sustainable development three pillars. I think that's a sustainable development where we can make, uh, put this topic and really globalize uh, the discussions and get solutions there. Thank you. John? The, in the words of uh, the American president, Abraham Lincoln, with public sentiment, nothing can fail, without it, nothing can succeed. 
I think uh, after all the discussions, after all the analysis, we now have to get down to business. <laughs> I would say if we look at this problem with facts and concrete solutions, I think we shall probably be better prepared to actually do that business and do it properly. Thank you very much indeed to you all. I I apologize for all of you who wanted to ask questions. Thanks to the panel. It's been fabulous. And see you next year. <laughs>